you come to my house on the day of my daughter's wedding, and then you're going to say that we're going to do a podcast together. Uh, hi, welcome to We Don't Know What to Watch, and with me is the uh, Don Corleone to my Michael Corleone, the wonderful, the incredible, the inimitable Kyle Mulford, and I'm Noah Saturn. What's up, Kyle? I always wanted to be Jor-El. <laughs> Um, not much. How's it going? Um, I don't know. Stella, I, I, Marlon Brando jokes. <laughs> On the waterfront's his best movie. No, his best movie is the Island of Doctor Moreau. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so. <laughs> What did we uh, watch on the magical spinning wheel this this week? Uh, we watched a movie called Tokyo Godfathers, written and directed by Satoshi Kon, who was this incredible anime director. He only made four films before he tragically died at the age of 46 of pancreatic cancer. So Yeah, I saw that. I haven't seen any of his other stuff, but, well, besides this now, except he did have a couple of that I've actually heard of, Paprika and Perfect Blue. Yep, Paprika is, is Perfect Blue, then Millennium Actress, which I haven't seen, and then this move film, and then Paprika, but I have seen Perfect Blue, and I have seen Paprika, and they are both excellent. Okay. I, I've heard good things about Paprika before, and I've heard of both of these. I think I've talked about Paprika before on the show, even. Okay. And then um, this was co-directed by Kiko Nobumoto. Why do we keep getting foreign movies where I can't pronounce anybody's names and it's, they're testing me? Because we're ignorant Americans. Yes, I know. And and getting all these foreign films is just proving this. Um, but he he co-directed and uh, I actually like liked the dialogue in this movie we watched. And this guy was the uh, head scriptwriter for Cowboy Bebop. So he's got good, uh, good screenwriting credit. That's true. So, he does have some good pedigree there. So this film definitely has a, a great, great creative talent going in so yeah so if that gives you any indication i'd say you might uh be able to figure out whether we liked this or mm -hmm. not um this is uh, we'll go into a couple things before this time um because this is i read it's an extremely loose remake of three godfathers and what that was is a 1930 uh, 1930 1913 novel by peter b kine and it was made into a movie three times. The premise of Three Godfather, or yeah, Three Godfathers is um, three bank robbers go into a town, and it's set in the Old West. And when they're escaping the town, they run across a woman who just had a baby and is dying, and then they have to take care of the baby. So, so, so what you're so saying is this is a really film. loosely based. On so, what you're saying is this is a book about three men. And a baby? Yes. Don't spoil things for later. <laughs> Which one is Ted Danson? <laughs> um, well... And does one of them have a mustache? I don't think so. And then was one of them the other... <laughs> was one of them Steve Gutenberg, the only one that wants to make Three Men and a Bride? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a completely different movie, and, and I, you might be spoiling my recommendation, even though you probably don't like the movie. <laughs> I honestly haven't seen Three Men and the Baby. Okay. Uh, I want to. It was first made in 1916 with uh, Harry Carey. I don't think that Harry I Carey. I wish it was the Harry Carey. Oh, we got a baby <laughs> in it. Holy cow. <laughs> and, and then uh, it was made again in 1936. And then in 1948, uh, John Ford made it in like, it was around the time Harry Carey died and he made it in honor of Harry Carey. Mm -hmm. And it starred John Wayne and Pedro... I can't remember the last name and uh, Harry Carey Jr. Cool. So, and I actually just because this was loosely based on this, I went and watched a couple weeks ago three uh, three Godfathers with John Wayne. So it was an interesting movie. It was just a quaint little western. Yeah, so, on a scale of uh, John Ford westerns, would you put it more towards like Stagecoach or more towards like The Searchers, one of his bigger ones? Well, if you're going Stagecoach is like a lesser movie, I probably. At least it's not as high budget, I guess. Yeah, more towards that. Less visual spectacle, especially. Oh, definitely that, because it was mostly them just standing around in the desert mm -hmm. with a baby. So, <laughs> But it was an interesting movie nonetheless. This movie had a 90%, well, the movie we're talking about, Tokyo Godfathers, had a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes with 67 critics 
and a 91% with 13,000 users. And it, uh, it opened in a couple of film festivals, festivals around here and in Japan in 2003, and then had a limited release here in like about 10 theaters or so in January of 04 and only made like 129,000 mm-hmm. in its theater run here. So uh, very, very limited run in the theater here. But I think it's gotten plenty of good reviews and and uh people talk about it people still like it yeah so why don't we get into the movie what's this about well this is about uh three homeless people that find a baby that's just kind of been abandoned on christmas eve and then they have to first of all take care of the baby and second of all solve the mystery of uh finding the baby's parents one winter's eve In Tokyo, Japan, three homeless people discover an abandoned baby and join together to reunite mother and child. Yeah, and it's kind of, I wasn't sure what to expect, but it's, there's a lot of like subtle little humor with some of the dialogue in there, which I kind of It's a very sincere film, which I really enjoyed. Uh, Yeah. Because it was a lot about family, obviously, and the dynamics of family Mm -hmm. from your traditional families and to your not so traditional family. Because we have what, like, um, Jin is a, uh, these are the three homeless. Jin is a drunk gambler. He's a grumpy, middle-aged, drunken gambler. Who lies about how, like, what happened to his family. Lies about everything. Lies about everything. Um, We have uh, Hannah, who is a... Former drag queen and trans woman, so she just kind of does her thing. Yeah. She's pretty great. <laughs> she She's awesome. And then we have Miyuki, Mayuki, who is uh, just a teenager who ran away from home, but after a very violent uh, seems, seems argument like, with her yeah, father. With, as after a traumatic event. And then they sort of kind of live on the streets together, even if their relationship is somewhat antagonistic at times. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting because they all have this conflict at home that I think that they felt there was more conflict than there actually was. Mm -hmm. And they felt like they weren't wanted anymore. And then throughout the movie, you come to realize that they were kind of projecting a little too much. So we start with them, uh, well, basically at <laughs> at a church program with the because this is taking place on Christmas. Is it Christmas Eve? Or it's Christmas, Christmas Eve Day? at the start of the film. And by yeah, the film by time the, it ends, it's like New Year's. Yeah. So uh, there, there's a lot of references apparently to um, twelve twenty five. Uh, mm-hmm. It's on a keychain they find. It's on the cab fare. It's in an address in a newspaper ad, and it's on the cab license plate. <laughs> and there might be a couple other locations that you can find twelve twenty five. Yep. And there's a lot of uh, references to angels. Um, I noticed there's like the top of the cab had an A and it was like the light was shaped like an angel. Um, Miyo- Miyuki named her cat angel and she thought that's what the argument was about at home. Um, and then there was, well, and then Hannah always called the baby kind of an angel. She was yeah. like sent from God, you know, and and <laughs> saved her from a lot of stuff you know tragedies happen like around her but like she misses it every time she's holding the baby yeah (laughs) which was great um but they find a baby in the trash and hannah names her kyoko and that becomes another coincidence yeah every this film is built around sort of like i guess you could argue like serendipitous coincidences sort of same things and kind of almost repeated motifs of yeah, everything. Everything seems is to be about sort of either forgiveness. It's almost like in a Forrest Gump sort of way, or like he just happens to kind of run into these situations, and that's kind of part of the fun. Very uh, Picard-esque, if I if I want to flex my old English literature muscles. So <laughs> a Picard-esque a Picard-esque novel would be something like Don Quixote is sort of the big example. It's less about an overarching plot and more about kind of more episodic going from place to place. Yeah, and. The whole coincidence thing is just kind of showing the nuance of how everyone seems to be connected through coincidence. Mm -hmm. Because everyone they run into somehow was meant to run into because it led to another clue, even though they didn't know this person. It led to another clue to the next step in the plot and to the next step in finding the parents of this baby. Yeah, this actual film, if you think for a film that seems kind of 
almost loose and shaggy as it feels. It's very tightly plotted, which it, I appreciated. It is. Like, every character they run into is somehow related and, like, integral to the advancement of their story. There is, There are no wasted characters, which I thought was nice. Yeah, so... uh they take the baby and they have big they have arguments all the time because they're they're a family dynamic it's you know like the mm-hmm. like the, the, mom the trans the guy is the mom and then you know yep. the drunk is the dad and then the runaway teenager is the is, is, the, is the teenager is the teenager and uh so they have an argument about what to do with the baby and so they finally decide first things first all right we gotta take it home and then we're gonna try and feed it give it some formula or whatever and then we find out that Jin had a daughter at one point, so he knows how to take care of babies. Yeah. At least he has some experience. And they start following clues. There's a there's a key there was a key with the baby that fit into a locker. That's the one thing I was going that must have been a very specific kind of key because they knew exactly where to go with that locker. I don't know. Maybe it's lost in translation where they Maybe it's just a specific thing about Tokyo that we don't understand. That that could because be because we're ignorant Americans. Yeah. But, but anyway, they knew where to go with this key. Uh, and that was the key that had the 1225 on it. And they find uh, they find bags in there, and they start following the clues. And, and they run into a guy at the cemetery trapped under his car. Well, before that, remember, they try and... All right, we kind of know where this basic neighborhood is, so we're going to feed the baby, and then tomorrow morning we're going to get on the train, and then the train is going to take us to where we want to go, but then the train gets delayed. Yeah. And then... You know, what I like, there's this little thing is just like when they're on the train kind of talking about the baby and stuff, everyone else is just kind of like holding their noses. It's like, it's like yeah, it must be something smelling bad. It's like, have you showered in a while? No, I haven't <laughs> washed my clothes either because remember, these are homeless people. So Yeah. And then Miyuki, I like this moment. Like she sees another train stop, go by, and then she just kind of looks at it. And then she sees someone she recognizes in the window in like the opposite train the other person's like ah you and then try to get over there but then she freaks out whoever it is it's someone she doesn't want to see so then she just kind of like goes out the window and unfortunately on her way out she like all the formula that they had just kind of spilled on the ground so that that means Jen and Hannah and the baby then tag after her and just start walking down the train tracks in the middle of the snow and you brought up another thing that gets pointed out in this also is the way people treat the homeless because we're following these three homeless people and we get to know them and we get to know their problems, why they're mm-hmm. on the street. And every scene that you have where they're in public, it's kind of people look at them with disdain, which is kind of what you do. It's kind of sad. Yeah, because you don't know what their problem is. Yeah, mm-hmm. some some homeless people might be drug addicts or something who's only going to spend their money on alcohol and whatever, but you don't know... That next guy there could be someone who lost his entire family and has no money and doesn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it it kind of pointed that out several times in the in the movie. It's a very humanitarian film. In addition to everything, is about sort of either forgiveness or redemption, but you know, forgiving someone else or especially just kind of forgiving yourself for your own sins or for your own crimes, at least how you, at least your perceptions of them. Yeah. So as we follow them. They they find a guy who is uh, they help him out because he's yeah, stuck under his car. They go to car. a cemetery and then like oh no we know baby has no food what are we gonna do what are we gonna do and then they find like someone had left left a gift on this child's grave it was like a bunch of formula it's like oh no things are saved so there's kind of our first lucky coincidence or I don't know Christmas miracle if you're into that sort of thing yeah there's there's a lot of little Christmas miracles in here. Mm-hmm. And so, so then this guy under the car, they help him <laughs> out. Like and, and struggling <laughs> under his own car, so it's kind of funny almost. The animation is very cartoonish. Yeah. It's, it's very good at practicing sort of exaggeration just in facial features, which I think obviously helps get things around. It's very visual. I mean, there is some dialogue, but there's there never really feels like a big... There are no sort of exposition dumps, because they, they don't have to necessarily explain anything about their premise. You just kind of, here's the premise... Here's what we're doing, and it just kind of goes. Yeah, and there there was actually a there was a lot of animators that worked on this on different scenes in this, and I did watch a thing on YouTube. It was kind of a little uh, documentary type thing, you know, about 10, 13 minutes about the animators and what they did and everything. And yeah, they did overemphasize some of the facial expressions just to get those across, but um, but some of it was also they tried to get like some sort of realism in there because 
the director, I think the director and his wife and then another guy would run around and they'd film it to get the right arm and leg movements for the running in this. And then even with the bike scene where he's on the bike not going anywhere, I think it was the director got on a bike and they put the wheel up so he's just sitting there spinning in place to, to kind of get a feel for how to animate that. So they took a lot of real life um, reference films and stuff yeah and they, they which they made themselves yeah just going running around yeah and and referencing that so there's a saying that kind of act that uh animation is acting one frame at a time because a lot of times animators act things out on their own uh, i know there is uh, there's a video out there of someone who's working on the scene from spider-man into the spider-verse where it's the con- first conversation at the diner between miles and peter b parker and this animator actually shot the whole video, whole, shot the scene of her doing the faces and the voices. And a lot of it is frame for frame, a lot of the same expressions. It's pretty cool to see a side by side. So animation really is acting one frame at a time. Yeah. And it's really cool like to see some of those. It, just some of your favorite animated movies. Just seek out what the animators did to get the look that they got. And it's a lot of those behind the scenes are really fascinating. I agree. So where were we? So they find this guy, and this is it's like, oh, it's like, oh, thank you for saving me. He gives them some money because he kind of notices their situation. Like, listen, if you need anything, here's my card. Yeah, and then they find and, out this that is he's like in he's the... got a nice car. He's got he's a very yeah. well dressed dude. He obviously has money. They find out he's from like the same neighborhood as the club that the mom of the baby worked at. So they're like, well. Do you know this club? He's like, oh yeah, the owner's marrying my daughter today. <laughs> Why don't you come on down? <laughs> so, so there's there's a really first big coincidence where it's like, oh, uh, we'll just get invited to this mm-hmm. wedding of the the guy who owns the club that the mom worked at. <laughs> I guess that's when I think of coincidences. Normally, you know, you want in your film no coincidences i mean but pixar has the idea that a coincidence is good if it gets you into trouble and i would argue this film kind of follows that to its natural conclusion where every coincidence gets them further and further in trouble until the climax of the movie yeah and you know when i think of a good example of a coincidence that gets you into trouble is like when uh, you know butch in pulp fiction is finally just getting to leave town and then he sees as he's in his car, and then he sees you know Marcellus Wallace walking across, <laughs> and runs in and sees him right there. That's a, that's a great example. Of, that's a coincidence that gets them into trouble. Yeah, and you're right. This one it does because they go to this wedding, and it's not like everything runs smoothly. They they're there, and the guy they want to talk to, all of a sudden, an assassin comes in and tries to shoot the father-in-law. And then the groom jumps in front and takes the bullets instead, so they can't actually even talk to him. And this whole thing, the tension is keeps building and building because Jin realizes, oh crap, this is the guy who he owes all of his gambling money to, and he feels like this yeah. man ruined my life. So yeah, so he's about ready to attack him, and hit then, him with a bottle or something. But then, no, instead, someone like, else wants to kill someone the tries, father. Someone shoots him instead, <laughs> and and he wasn't even trying to shoot him. Yeah. <laughs> he just jumped in the way. So you find out that like. Another thing is you realize that all these things that like the the three homeless people are realizing that a lot of the problems are brought on themselves where they go, you know, here it goes, oh, this guy actually saved this his future father-in-law's life. He's actually a good person. And then later in the movie, he comes to realize, oh, you know, it wasn't him. I'm the one who racked up the debt. Yeah. He had nothing to do. It was my do. Gam- problem gambling. Yeah. So, it, like, it's not his fault that I'm in this position. So, um, so that he gets sh- shot and then uh, the, the shooter was the maid and she steals or takes Miyuki. Takes and the wig off. It's Kyoko actually a guy. And, takes Miyuki and the baby Kyoko and then kind of runs away with them. So now Jane and Harry are like, oh, crap. We got to go find him. So they're they're running around and then they get into a fight because they're always bickering like an old married couple, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they split up. And um, Jin finds a dying old man in the in the street and he gives him a bag and says, "Well, take care of this, and I'm dying or whatever." My last wish. I like this scene. My last <laughs> wish is to uh, like just have like a swig of your of your bottle. He gives him a swig and then this. You see outside this guy's homeless hut, there's like these kind of spinning windmills or gears, homemade stuff like you'd see in the yard sale. 
And then, you know, then he's going to see slowly close his eyes. Things stop spinning. Then uh, Jin just kind of sits there. And then the guy wakes up again and then things start spinning again. <laughs> yeah, it was a great transition between great, the, the windmills and it was Very like, nice cut. Um, very good. I, uh, can I have one more swing here, Jin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was funny. I, as much as a dying old man can be funny, he was funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, at that point, also, we get like a bunch of teens coming in who like to beat up homeless people apparently because people are terrible yeah because another another thing where it's like you're awful like these people are very much the bottom of the bottom of society yeah and so they beat up Jin and leave him for dead and miyuki is with this spanish family so he's yeah she ends up going to like the assassin's home and then luckily she happens to be with the assassin's wife who's like hey i'll nurse the baby because she happens to have a baby of her own Coinc- coincidentally yeah coincidentally that's <laughs> what a coinky dink mm-hmm. and she's kind of bonding with this family even though they speak spanish and she doesn't know what they're saying and yeah, they was, don't know what she's saying at least in the version i watched uh the film was primarily in Japanese and subtitled, except the Spanish was not subtitled. So that you were in the same position. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, did you watch it on Crackle then? Yeah, I watched it on Crackle, which, you know, it's a free streaming service, so there's ads, but I don't like ads. Still going to be grumpy about it. <laughs> yeah. At least with these free services, though, they don't edit the films. That is It's nice. not like a TV edit where you get ads and it's made for TV where anybody can watch it. Mm-hmm. You know, these are, if it's an R-rated movie, everything's in there. So I, I appreciate, yeah, I agree. I agree. I don't want to watch ads either, but I do appreciate these free services that have this where, you know, a lot yeah. of people can watch these movies and just have to pay for the internet is all. Um, Hannah, oh yeah, Hannah is in a cab and driving around town and then searching for Miyuki and then she's like hearing babies crying everywhere or no that was that was a later scene this one she yeah. hears the baby cry in the neighborhood and runs in kind and finds her run, runs up and then at one point you know Miyuki opens the window and then you see Hannah's face like ah <laughs> and and they uh decide to go they don't know where to go Jin is list missing um and so another Angel reference, they decide to go back to a place called Angel Tower where Hannah used to do a drag it's, show yeah, type where, singing. Where she would perform. And and so they have a flashback to her singing there and then getting into an argument with a customer and that's why she ran away. And then this was another one where she comes to realize, she talks to the owner. The owner's like, I'm so glad you're back. And she's like, but I beat up this guy and got in a fight and broke everything. She's like... Well, not that a little money didn't fix. And yeah, it's, like, it's, it's just fine. like, what, why, why were you gone? It's yeah, just... it's, it's <laughs> almost a self-imposed exile was for not. Like, it's not your fault. Yeah, and, and kind of all of them and were that's okay. a little that's... bit. And and there, you we also find that uh, one of the angels there found Jin and brought him into the place. So coincidentally, the person they went to was also the pers- the people that found Jin mm-hmm. and brought him in. So they're reunited here. Then you find some of Hannah's backstory, how like her her lover died or her husband died or something. Yeah, yeah, which is you know sad. So they each have their own personal tragedy that they have to deal with. I and I I did like when Jin was found. It <laughs> you see this bright light behind. She she's actually dressed like an angel, and you see this bright white behind bright light behind her, and uh, she's glowing. And she goes, "Would you like some of my magic or an ambulance?" And it's just like um, an ambulance. <laughs> It's like, well, fine. <laughs> it's like, I'm not sure what kind of magic she was going to perform on him. but um, So they're all uh, there, rescued by angels. And and they also come across, uh, they find the buildings from a picture in the bag. And they see a newspaper article with those same buildings in the background. And so then they figure out where to go. Kind of figure and, out the basic neighborhood. And, and then ironically, they go... And they find this abandoned house that's kind of like just run down, burnt down almost, but like st- stuff is still in it. And they stay there for the night with a bunch of cats. <laughs> and then the cat lady comes around, who was the landlord or something. Yeah. And, she, and she's like... I like during the cat scene, they're, like, they're trying to get rid of him. And the mute, he's like, no! <laughs> These are all mine! What? <laughs> Well, then Jin's like, I, I can sure use to eat some meat right now. And, <laughs> and Miyuki throws a cat in his yeah. face. Uh, they they wake up in the morning and they 
leave this abandoned building and look behind them and they realize that it was the house all along but the front yeah. is the front is missing it's so, just really, gone. so they tried the there's just a door standing there in a frame and they tried the key in it and he walks through and it's like <laughs> honey i'm home <laughs> and so they asked the landlady where they can find the mom and then jin find jin finds out that the guy that they're looking for is also a drunken gambler so he kind of relates with that and is like oh this is kind of what i was doing like i was kind of putting people out here you know and and ruining things for the people around me so eventually they find out who this woman was her name was sachiko something or other who is so the baby's mother and then they's like all right can we find her apartment so they find her apartment and then at one point i think uh that's when hannah collapses or something yeah and then they have to take her to the hospital and they talk about you know sorry i'm saving money so i'm gonna have this money for some good food Everything's good. They talk about this money in this scene. And then, of course, when they get to the hospital after Hannah's okay. It costs so them everything they had. Just about almost everything they had. And uh, then we see uh, Jin, excuse me, Jin sees a nurse there. And it turns out to be his daughter. And her name is Kyoko. Yeah. So there's another coincidence. Because he's not the one who named the baby. It was Hannah. Yep. And she had no idea. So Hannah goes off on Jin for lying about everything. Like, Wait a minute, your daughter's still alive? You weren't a bicycle racer? You ran a bicycle shop? Stuff like that? Yeah. Because you gambled, not because you got injured? Or just... Yeah, so everything, because he was ashamed of who he was, he lied about everything and even lied about his family being dead to gain sympathy. And which, so Hannah was rightfully mad at him because... Oh, she has every right to be angry. And, and so she tells the nurse kyoko was just like that's who your father is he's a liar and a gambler and a drunk and, it's like, <laughs> and then she storms off and her and miyuki storm off and just kind of start walking where they think towards the apartment of the woman even though jin was the one who had the address because they're just mad at least hannah's just mad yeah and then you and then you get another huge coincidence where she's going this mother is probably like on her last string and she's gonna commit suicide or something and, and like, then i like this as they walk by they see someone like staring at the bridge and starting to get on top of it yeah they're like oh what no 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 pull her down what's her name and then they realize like oh it's the mother <laughs> it's so uh, huzzah they get to give the baby back to the mother everything is perfect right right <laughs> And so then Jin finally, Jin makes his way over to the apartment. She's really messy, just like fast food containers everywhere. Someone who's living there is not taking care of themselves very well. Yeah. And before he goes there, though, he sees uh, news, uh, the news on the television at the hospital. Yeah, like, oh, this baby has gone missing. This family really wants it back. It's like, oh, maybe it's our baby. I think it's Kyoko. And then they come to realize that the baby was stolen from the hospital. They're like... Oh, great. Now they think we're kidnappers. Or <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes and finds the father and he's like a you know, also they talk about too. like this lottery ticket who won like this tons of money. It was like it was like just one 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 yeah. one one. And this bizarre coincidence. And, <laughs> and of course we find out he has the lottery ticket because it was in the red bag given to him by the dying man. Yeah, and we, we get that right at the very end where he's uh but but yeah, we'll get to that because you you think why are we showing the lottery ticket? Because yeah. you don't know what's in that bag. It's so. just a background detail. Yeah, and so so he sees that he meets the guy, and then he has to go and find. Uh, so he gets on a he steals a bike. So the whole story about him being a bike racer, he ends up racing a bike through the streets, <laughs> and he uh, runs into. Miyuki, 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 mm -hmm. can't say that name, and uh, Hannah, and and tells them, oh, hey, that's not the real mom. Oh, we oh, just gave him crap. We just gave it back. To, we gotta go find her. So they're chasing around, and then all of a sudden, like, they're looking for a baby in, in the town, and, and uh, or in the city, and then all of a sudden, they're just hearing babies everywhere. Yeah, of course. And, <laughs> and finally, Miyuki See the mom in a sees, truck, and the mom's driving the truck. This they see her at a park, and she runs away and steals yeah. a truck. Yeah, Sachiko so steals a truck with the baby inside. And then we it's get like an exciting action, action scene. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was it was a cool chase because it's like there's a cab involved, and and uh, Jin gets on the side of the truck and is trying to get in. And he's like, and then they crash into a building, and he's got the he took the baby out of the truck and is like rolling and like protecting the babies, <laughs> and uh, then. She comes back out and he's laying on the ground and she steals the baby again and runs to the roof of a building. And then now, of course, the police gets involved. There's helicopter footage. They see her running up to the top of the building. It's like, okay, what's she going to do? What's she going to do? 
And Miyuki comes up and talks to her. And, and, and then we find out the reason she's been so sad is the fact that, you know, her baby was stillborn. Yeah. So then she kind of, but she saw all the babies looked really happy except her. So she saw this baby smiled at her. So she wanted to steal it, but then felt bad. So abandoned it. And now like she's going to try and commit suicide with, with the baby. Yeah, it's it's almost like she just kind of snapped after a stillborn baby. I mean, and imagine what that could do to you. Mm-hmm. It's very yeah. very sad. Yeah, it still doesn't justify stealing a baby, but that, she's that definitely can, not mentally. Yeah, not mentally well. And so she actually ends up like Miyuki can't talk her off the ledge, so she goes and jumps. But Miyuki and Jen and Jen and Hannah get there just pull in her time. back, but pull then her. the baby gets dropped. And then Hannah's like, this is the only thing I have. So Hannah jumps down, grabs the baby, kind of makes it to the side of the building. Of course, there's a storm or wind, falls down, and this is... She's on a banner. The climax of the film. Banner breaks, she's falling down, things aren't going well, but then last coincidence in the film, a gust of wind saves her and kind of pulls her back into safety. And and again, it was because she was holding the baby. Yep. Holding the baby saved her with that gust of wind. It saved her when they walked out of a store and a car just randomly crashed in there. You know, um, it saved her when they were walking and, and two cars crashed bes- behind her. So it's all these Christmas miracles with this baby. So, you, you know, Kyoko is Japanese for, you know, pure child. So I guess yeah. angel maybe is a, another interpretation. So it really yeah. is, I guess, a guardian angel in the form of a baby. And that's that's when we get to the hospital again because they're all banged up and everything and and they're getting checked out and then you find out that like they drop the bag underneath their coats and you see the lottery ticket when a, a pop out so like you see that mm-hmm. all that's, ones <laughs> you've got so Hannah now realizes that they're okay with her at Angel Tower and she knows she can go back there um, and now Jin you see that he has the winning ticket so he can pay off his gambling debts and go back to and try and make amends with his family and, and then then, uh, then a cop walks in. And we find out the cop also happens to be Miyuki's dad, so there's a nice reunion there. Yeah, and and he's ecstatic to see her. So, you know, again, it was, she did a bad thing. I mean, she stabbed her dad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, I mean, she did kind of do a bad thing, but it was... Very much not in her right mind. Yeah. A crime of passion or whatever. Yeah, so there's, there's a reunion there. So, like, you see this whole thing where they kind of formed a family themselves, but then they get to go back to their traditional families as well. There's an Mm -hmm. area of redemption. Very much, I guess, there's the family you're born into, but then there's the family you choose. So kind of chosen family or found family. And that's also very big in, you know, the Marvel movies. They arguably come together as a found family to form the Avengers or whatever. And then it's also especially big in the X-Men since they're considered outsiders. Yeah. And you get this uh, feeling of even though you see that they're going to go back to their other families and try and make an amends there and try and get back into it, they're also going to stay together because the the real couple who were the parents of the baby, they were told who saved the baby and, and the cops are like, it's just a couple of homeless people. And they're like, I don't care. They saved my baby. So I want to make all three of them godfathers. Yes. So, um, so y- having that connection to that child means that even if they go back to their families, they're still going to have each other and, and also have that kind of extended family, extended family there. So it was, it was a really touching ending. It was, it was nice to see everything come full circle. And and like you said, a lot of redemption in there and then also forgiving yourself because it was, that was a big theme of this because it was like the, the people they left never wanted them to leave in the first place yeah so and everybody lived happily ever after yeah so this was a very solid christmas movie i feel like if i end up getting like a dvd copy this would probably make it to its regular rotation because it's yeah. very sweet and it's very also very very well made and you know you can't necessarily watch like uh the you know it's a wonderful life again even though that has its own charms yeah this would be a nice one to kind of throw on for your family just kind of Switch it up a little. And there is an English dub, I believe, but we just watched this sub version. But yeah, and you can find this on, like we said, on Sony Crackle. And I honestly, if we're going to the rec or the 
whether we recommend this or not, I'm going to say I highly recommend this one. I recommend this film as well as uh, some of the other Satoshi Kon films. He also worked on a TV show, but I haven't seen that. Yeah, this is this is definitely a good one. And I do go back and watch. Like, now I watch these movies twice before the podcast. Cause I you like watch to... Redneck Zombies twice? No, this is I, I started doing this after that one. Okay. <laughs> so but we started switching over to ninety percent or higher. Yes. I, I started watching them twice. So like even if one's not the greatest, I'll still watch it just to watch it first and get like immerse myself in it and then watch it to take notes. And I'm this is one that I would I was glad to watch it again. And to call back to another episode we did, this we've talked about how there's a lot of coincidences and then there was like no wasted space. It's kinda like hot fuzz. There's not any wasted dialogue. There's not any wasted characters. Like everything tied back to to it, it in a different way, but it was all used so well and so tight throughout the whole. Yeah, film. it's which ultimately I think if you can do that in your film, it makes for a much more satisfying experience. Yeah, because you don't have any filler where it's just like, what was the purpose of this? Yeah. And what like why why did I see that? Because you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of movies where you watch them and it's like a two hour movie and you go i could have cut a half hour out of that and it would not have changed the story yes there's like something like hot fuzz and tokyo godfathers they're so tightly scripted that there's nothing you would cut out of this Mm -hmm. not an ounce of fat here so yeah again a recommendation for this one definitely and if you don't mind ads go watch it on sony crackle yes (laughs) and the other thing i thought was nice was I think one of the other free services, when we watched another anime-type movie, it was uh, it was an English dub, and that might have been on Amazon Prime, whereas Sony Crackle, even with the anime here, they have the Japanese language version. Mm-hmm. So that that's a bonus to that. But anyway, let's uh, get into our double feature recommendation. Yeah, what would you... Um, this is kind of... I didn't really think about this one, honestly, that much. I just, you know, just had other stuff on my mind. Okay. But if I had to pick one, it kind of comes if I guess I rec- I talked about Forrest Gump, but you know, everyone and their mom has seen Forrest Gump. But I think if there's any kind of I would argue slice of life movie, I'm going to have to come back to me. So, uh, what do you got? Okay. Well, mine was already spoiled and <laughs> I know it's a cheesy movie, but I, I'm a fan of Three Men and a Baby. I mean, you got Tom Selleck and Ted Danson and Steve Gutenberg. <laughs> Directed by Leonard Nimoy. Directed by Leonard Nimoy. The only, like, besides the two Star Treks he directed, the only notable movie he ever directed. And they they are just three men who, three bachelors who live in an apartment, and they've got their different personalities, which was great. And then a, a baby is dropped on their doorstep, and it's like the the mom is says it was one, it's Ted Danson's kid. And so then they have to, like, raise this and... Comedy ensues. And comedy ensues, and since it was, I think it was late 80s, uh, cocaine subplot ensues. <laughs> where where there was a supposed to be a package dropped at the door, and they think the package was the baby, but it was a different package. It was a cocaine package. <laughs> what? And then, and then the, the druggies come to pick up the package, so they just hand them the baby. Oh, no. And, and <laughs> so, you know, drugs and babies. And Gutenberg and Danson and Selleck. <laughs> that's that's my recommendation. That's I did not know about the cocaine subplot. <laughs> that came as a surprise. So yeah, uh, go out and watch that one. It's good. It's a fun uh, time. Yeah. So now I'm just gonna dither about until I can something comes to mind of a film about the biggest strongest thing. It was either kind of either you know forgiving yourself, then also found family versus actual family. But I'm just kind of drawing a blank at the moment. Uh, maybe Scooby Doo? No, not Scooby Doo. <laughs> uh, that's that's okay. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of. If I mean, just go watch other Satoshi Kon movies. We might cover them in the future. But go watch uh, Perfect Blue. Go watch Paprika. I love Paprika. And if you're if you like manga, I discovered a couple weeks back. I ended up reading this. Uh, Manga actually made by Satoshi Kon because he was a manga artist before he became an anime director. And that's called Satoshi Kon's Opus. And what it is, it's like, it's, it's, there's definitely kind of story within a story kind of level. So the first story is this manga about, you know, 
post-apocalyptic girl who's trying to fight like an evil serial killer and they're telepathically connected or whatever and so that's actually that story in itself is pretty engaging but then then the joke is that it steps back and it's about a manga artist who's trying to struggle to finish this last manga find this last page so he has he gets out the last page which has like two characters like killing each other at the same time a very dramatic kind of action-packed ending but then what happens when like he falls asleep and then ends up falling into the manga itself and then the character that's supposed to the hero that's supposed to die to sacrifice himself discovers discovers the last page like i don't want to do this and just runs off (laughs) so now the heroine and the manga creator have to work together try and get everything back on track before it falls apart and before his deadline looms it's mangaception it kind of is it definitely plays with the story within a story levels and it even has like some jokes like oh, how do you know about this page like is it? like at one point they get stuck like in the background and then like oh, that's what i get for not doing all the backgrounds like some of the backgrounds are just unfinished so then like there's all the buildings are like really flat and they just kind of fall over when they're touched and then they come across a crowd of people, but none of them have faces just because it's, <laughs> it's just because it's a background. I, it's, if you like comics and if you read manga, I think definitely recommend that. And I also found out that uh, you know Hayao Miyazaki was also a manga artist before he switched over to primarily being an anime director. So Nausicaa is actually based off of his own manga. So oh wow! And Oof. I read part of Nausicaa. I read the whole thing. Never saw that movie. Been coming across a lot of uh, anime here with. Ghost in the Shell and Tokyo Godfathers, and then our giant size special of uh, Akira. I think it's definitely something worth dipping our toes into. It's always all about ex- because that's the purpose of this show. I think was to sort of expand our horizons and find some gems. Yeah, and and yeah, that's why we do. That's why we do the random because sometime we're going to come across stuff that we've seen, like Hot Fuzz. We knew we loved that one, but we got to talk about a movie we love. But then there's stuff like this where this is out there free for you to watch. And, you know, how many people know that that's sitting there on Sony Crackle and how many people are going to think to look for this movie? And then another movie I really enjoyed was probably Us and Them, which was just this really nice drama that I probably wouldn't have discovered otherwise. Yeah. And that's just sitting there on Netflix. So So, uh, now we decided we're going to do something different. We're going to expand our horizons a little bit. We're going to go from like 70% to 100% of Rotten Tomatoes so that we can get a little bit more variety because... What we found, at least what Kyle was telling me, is that if you just keep on 90 to 100, you come across some movies that are good, but then you come across other movies like Marjorie Prime, which are highly rated, but of like 10 reviews or something. Ten, yeah, like 10 critics saw it and they all liked it because it's this artsy movie. And so then it's like 100% on there, but only 10 critics watched Versus it. Versus like 100% out of like a couple hundred reviews or something. And it's, I guess, very well regarded from a wider perspective. Yeah. Like Toy Story. So if we go, I mean, we could still run into some of those because we're doing 70 to 100%. But the 70 and 80%, you're going to get a lot of the stuff that is classics, but there's always haters out there. Yep. So, so um, what genre do we want to do? What have we not done in a while? That um, When was the last time we did a horror movie? We haven't done that in a while. I think that's been a little while. So maybe if we go horror and go to the 70% and greater. Mm-hmm. And sure, we're just on movies here and spin the wheel. <laughs> Speaking of which, we got one that's hundred percent. What is it? The domestics. Is that like about domestic beer? <laughs> yes, I think so. It's a documentary about domestic beer. It is on Prime Video. A young husband and wife must fight to return home in a post-apocalyptic Midwestern landscape ravaged by gangs. Interesting. It's got Kate Bosworth. Interesting. And Tyler Hutchlin, who I think was... uh, Is he the guy who plays Superman on... Or am I thinking of a different... He might be a different guy who plays Superman on Supergirl. Okay, I know the name, though. I'm just... So it does sound familiar. And you can find it on Prime Video or Hulu, actually. Oh, that's nice. And no, that might actually be the guy. This is a 2018 movie. Okay. So next time is The Domestics. Yep. And uh, I guess until we see you again. Uh, Forgiveness is divine, but never pay full price for a late pizza. And uh, I was going to say, try the veal. It's the best in town. <laughs>